Welcome to the Nevada Museum of Art. Today's talk, Living with the Industrial Revolution by Professor Dennis Dworkin. My name is Christian Davies. I'm the Gene Jones Director of Public Programs here at the Nevada Museum of Art. I'd like to start off by thanking all of our exhibition sponsors, some of which are with us uh, here this afternoon. We appreciate your support and are delighted to be able to share the Victorian radicals from the Pre-Raphaelites to the Arts and Crafts Movement exhibition with our audiences uh, with your generous support. The museum is now open and you can purchase tickets to visit the exhibition by visiting nevadaart.org. Uh, we definitely hope that you come and see us. It's a tremendous exhibition um, and come on down. After this afternoon's talk, we'll have time for a brief uh, Q&A conversation. So please use the Q&A feature, which is found towards the bottom of your screen to queue up any questions that you might have and uh, we'll work those into the conversation. Today's talk features uh, Professor Dennis Dworkin who is a professor and chair of the Department of History at the University of Nevada, Reno. He has a PhD in modern history from the University of Chicago. He is a historian of Britain and Ireland with a specialty in cultural theory. Uh, he has been translated into Chinese, Portuguese, and Turkish. His books include Cultural Marxism in Post-War Britain, History, the New Left and the Origins of Cultural Studies from Raleigh Durham Duke University Press, 1997, Class Struggles, London, uh, Routledge 2006 and Ireland and Britain 19, uh, 1798 to 1922, an anthology of sources, Boston Hackett Publishing 2012. His essay, Terrorism, an American Story, is in the Cambridge History of, Terror, uh, History of Terrorism, which will be published this August. Professor Dworkin, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kristen. I really appreciate that very kind introduction. Even though I confess I actually wrote it myself, but that's you know, thank you very, thank, thank you very, thank you very much. And um, I want to I want to say that in many respects this is a dream come true. Um, I've been in Reno for 28 years, and I've always wanted to give a museum talk, and I never imagined that you know the Nevada Museum of Art, which has done so many amazing things, would have an exhibit of this stature from the British Isles, and to have the best collection of pre-Raphaelite art from the amazing city of Birmingham, England, which has a special place in my heart because I've been there multiple times, although never to the museum. And so therefore, I wanna, I wanna thank David Walker, and I wanna thank um, uh, Ann Wolf, the curator, uh, for helping put this together and also giving tours from my class uh, coming up in April. Christian for uh, helping me in putting this together and also Darby Walker, a fellow Anglophile who I have a sneaking suspicion has something to do with me giving this talk. And so I'm gonna share my screen, everything hopefully will go well. And we can all see this, good. People out there, you can see it? Looks great. Hello? Okay, great, okay. So originally in the world before COVID, I was supposed to give uh, two talks, um, one on uh, what the industrial revolution was and the second one living with the industrial revolution. And uh, the idea for these talks was not to really uh, address the exhibit per se, which Art historians are in a much better position to do than me, but the idea was to kind of help people see the exhibit in terms of the world of which these works of art uh, existed and took place and the discussions in which they took place. So what I'm gonna do is uh, first just gesture at what the industrial revolution is because without actually knowing what it is, I don't think we can actually understand what it meant to live with it. And then I'm gonna, through a, a, a series of works of art, I'm gonna use those as a point of departure to discuss the world of the pre-Raphaelites, what they existed and actually end up with uh, talking about one of the paintings in the exhibit. So to actually give a full explanation of the industrial revolution is massive. I mean, people spend their lives doing it. I'd have to talk about the British Empire, the slave trade, mining, the development of infrastructure, 
the ideologies that developed. I mean, it just goes on and on. But I'm gonna do it just in uh, three images which express the transformations that took place of what I see as a combination of mechanization, the transformation from hand to mechanized labor, but also equally important that it took place within a capitalist framework, a market society. And those two things are, I think, are central. So we start out with you know, the crudest of inventions in retrospect, but was pretty big then, the spinning jenny of 1764, which is not mechanized, but is the beginning of uh, making uh, spinning more uh, efficient. And then this is transformed by not the first steam engine, but the most successful steam engine in the 1780s, and that's James Watt's steam engine. And then in the space of a generation or two, this is the next slides from the 1820s, we see the spinning mules, which represent you know, the development of the factory system and the uh, really transformation into an industrial economy. And that's something like in the space of 50 years. I'm gonna also try to give you an indication of the transformation in workspace. So the first textile mill from 1771 is pretty crude, the Cromford Mill, and this is based on water power. Here's a second image of it. We know it's historically important because it's got a tea shop and you know, tourists can go and you know, drink tea. It gives them a, a sense of fulfillment. And then this is uh, in the 1826, an image of the Preston Cotton Mill, which gives you also a sense of the transformation and scale. Preston's particularly important because it's the site of Charles Dickens' hard times and the general strike in Preston in 1842 resulted in the death of five people. And it's very, very important in 19th century labor history. I'm gonna begin with a quote from Marx in terms of making sense of this, but it's not a quote that most people associate with Marx because despite the fact that Marx thought industrial capitalism was uh, unequal and exploitative, he also was admiring of the transformation that the bourgeoisie had affected. And in fact, he says, the bourgeoisie has accomplished wonders far surpassing Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. It has conducted expeditions that put in the shade all former exoduses of nations and crusades. Hold the thought about Gothic cathedrals because we're gonna come back to them later. But there are many voices in making sense of this. Andrew Yur, a professor of applied economics at uh, Glasgow University in Scotland, was an apologist for the factory system, which he thought enabled workers, made labor easier, extended their lives and their wages, and thought that in fact, capitalists were what he called philanthropic. The actual phrase industrial revolution didn't come into currency until 1881 when Arnold Toynbee, an historian gave lectures on it. He, he lived to barely 30. And I'm gonna give you a, a quote from Toynbee that expresses the kind of image that Toynbee created, which has become enduring. Enduring, I didn't mean enduring. The effects of the Industrial Revolution prove that free competition may improve wealth without producing well being, which is the, I think you could say, the standard view of the Industrial Revolution. What I want to do is I want to make this more complex. I want to think of the Industrial Revolution in kind of a series of binary oppositions. I want to think of it in terms of progress, you know, one step forward one step back. I wanna think of it in terms of gain and loss. I wanna think of it in terms of progress and nostalgia. I wanna think of it as many kinds of oppositions. 
And I'm gonna do that in, through three works of art, uh, two paintings and one architectural. And so I'm gonna begin with what I call the compression of time and space. And through that, through one of the great paintings of the Industrial Revolution by the great English painter Turner, Rain, Steam and Speed, which was done in 1844, which is four years uh, before the Communist Manifesto and just before the founding of the Pre-Raphaelite movement. And here's the painting, a steam engine in a storm coming towards you um, over a railway bridge with another bridge in the background. There is a canoe in the river, which signifies the old world. And I've taught this uh, over many years and students say to me, well, this is modernity coming right at you, right? It's unstoppable. And it's also the blur suggests the ambiguity of what it means. And again, I think of a quote from Marx, which is also a quote that people don't associate with Marx. And that is, and notice the, the very clip phrases in this, the, the speeding up that he does. Constant revolutionizing of production, uninterrupted disturbance of all social conditions, everlasting uncertainty and agitation distinguished the bourgeois epoch from all earlier ones. All fixed thousand relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new form ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into air. And this great line, all that's solid melts into air, I think really evokes this painting. Not that I, for a moment, think that Marx was actually thinking about Turner when he did this, but they're in the same moment. They're in the same critical phrase. But I also want to bring this you know, down to earth, so to speak, by actually looking at the train and the bridge and seeing you know, the other side of this. And that's through the great engineer of the 19th century. And if any of a BBC poll is to be believed, is the second greatest Englishman, whatever that means. Winston Churchill obviously being the best. And that is Isambard Kingdom Brunel. This is the launch of the Great Eastern in 1857 with the great ships. And the idea was to create a railway line, the Great Western, which still exists today, from Paddington Station to Bristol, and then a ship to New York, which Brunel supervised through decades. I love this. You know, it's the opposite side of you know, the critical view, he's arrogant, he's confident, right? He, you know, knows what he wants and he knows what he's doing. And, you know, he is, you know, a great historical figure in his own mind and is. I also have to tell you that I love talking about him because I just love saying his name, which is part of, I think, of his charm. And here's the bridge that the train goes over. The uh, Maidenhead Bridge, which is designed by Brunel and which at the time had the largest spans of any bridge created. It was, it was created in the 1830s. And I think that one of, the, one of the least explored aspects of the Industrial Revolution is the infrastructure and bridges being one of them. And bridges in Britain to me are really just mind boggling beautiful very often. Here's, a, here's an artist's rendering of the Maidenhead Bridge. And then here's the train, the Firefly locomotive, which was put into production in 1844, four years before Turner painted it. Here's an image, another image of the Firefly locomotive, you know, in Jane Austen in the, say in 1810, 1815, it took two days to go from England to Portsmouth. Now it's a matter of hours. The trains went in 1844 when the painting was done about 50 miles an hour, which is just extraordinary in terms of its development. And the, you know, 
Brunel is famous also for Paddington Station, which is where the trains originated with its used arching shed, which is one of the wonders of architectural uh, design among railway stations. So, you know, to put together Turner and Brunel as, you know, kind of, you know, interconnected, but yet opposing figures in some way is one way to start. The second is to think about, to think about progress and nostalgia, which I think are absolutely central to modernity. Modernity is very often portrayed as moving forward, as transformation, as revolution and speed, but nostalgia is just as important as anybody who's been in Reno in August knows that hot August nights is absolutely central to the modern experience and the, you know, the multiple versions of hot August nights that exist across the United States. And this is the great exhibition of 1851, which is the first World's Fair, which was uh, designed by Joseph Paxson, who actually was a gardener. The idea was to create a structure for the buildings that could be put together and then dismounted. And in fact, it is the first building exclusively made of iron and glass. It was the first building made of prefabricated parts. It was manufactured, it was assembled, and then it was disassembled and moved to the suburbs of London. Where, and this is a picture, you know, obviously now we have photography, in 1851, it did not exist. This is how it existed in, you know, in the 20th century. And for reasons that I still cannot understand, but it has to do with the dilapidated state that it got into, it burned down in 1937. How a building iron and glass does that is a little mysterious to me, but as you can see, it actually did take place. And here is a, is a is a image of the uh, of the of the Crystal Palace. This absolutely magnificent structure. It said when the French uh, went to make the World's Fair in the 1890s, the great exposition, their great exposition. They since the British had gone horizontal, they were going to go vertical. Hence the Eiffel Tower. Whether or not that is true, I can't actually say, but. You know, it would have just been magnificent to actually go to the Great Exhibition. Here's the uh, opening of it. It was, um, it was, you know, the opening was done by Queen Victoria, who's um, in the center, of course, being the monarch. And then to the right of her in red and black is Prince Albert. Prince Albert, the German-born prince that she married, who was a great enthusiast for uh, industrial design and believed that the design was the future to Britain. And because of Alfred Albert's you know, great immersion in the great exhibition, the, uh, after it was dismantled and, and, and Hyde Park was, you know, went back to his, its natural state, was built the Victorian Albert Museum, which is the great you know, temple of design and many of the many of the many of the artifacts that were in the Great Exhibition you can see at the VNA. So the Great Exhibition. This is the interior of the Crystal Palace. It's the transept. You can see the the fact that Paxson was a gardener and created a kind of greenhouse, so that the shrubbery of Hyde Park was not torn down. It was actually became part of the exhibition space, which is really kind of, in, in my view, really kind of magnificent. And, you know, it just must have been a great experience to go to. There is, you know, there is literally um, 14,000 exhibitors in a space that was 990,000 square feet. But above all, it proclaims British industrial design, British industrial production. In the middle of the 19th century, Britain manufactured literally more 
than the whole rest of the world put together. And this, the Great Exhibition is its temple. So, you know, that's the one side, but what I love about the next slides are the other side. And that is the Gothic court. I told you to remember Gothic in the line from Marx. Marx used that purposely because the other side of the religion of progress was those of which the pre-Raphaelites were central who had second, third, and fourth thoughts about what so-called progress, market society, liberal ideology, liberal in the 19th century sense, which is the pure capitalist sense of a free market world meant and what it meant for human life, human community, and what I would call the culture and society tradition, which the Gothic court is an example of, says that what the industrial revolution has destroyed above all is community. This is how romantic conservatives and socialists met, not in what they believe should happen, but in their analysis of the destruction of community. So in the great exhibition is a Gothic court, which is a reminder of the nostalgia that exists in the first half of the 19th century and is so important to understanding art movements, both the pre-Raphaelites and the arts and craft movements that follow them. And so this tabernacle, which is one of the one of the pieces in the Gothic court, is designed by the very influential architect, another name I love to say, Augustus Welby Northmore Putin, whose father was French and his mother was English. And the uh, tabernacle we saw, which was to hold the sacraments, now can be seen in Southwark Cathedral, which is on the south bank of the Thames. And Pujan is absolutely central, if not the most central figure in creating in architecture, what's known as the Gothic revival, which is the idea that the industrial revolution has created not only machinery, but a mechanistic society. And that art, which should be a barometer of it has fallen into decline. And so Pujan, who designed churches in the medieval style, wanted the world to return to the community and labor, skilled labor of the Middle Ages. And this is huge for the Pre-Raphaelites. He says, the erection of churches, like all that was produced by zeal or art in ancient days, has dwindled down into mere trade. They are erected by men who ponder between a mortgage, a railroad, or a chapel as the best investment of their money. The Gothic revival represents a counterpoint to the materialism, the market capitalism of the Industrial Revolution, which for people like Pujan meant not only, you know, fragmentation of society, but spiritual bankruptcy. And Pujan's greatest achievement is something that we don't associate with being modern, are the Houses of Parliament, which he worked on with the architect Barry. Pujan, in order to be truly medieval, converted to Catholicism, which in 1830s Britain was not a popular move. Therefore, he had to be the secondary architect on the uh, Palace of Westminster, the, the off, the, uh, where Parliament is held, probably the most famous building in Britain. And the reason that it was, you know, he was part of this because in fact, in 1835, the old buildings of Parliament burned down. And so when they went to design the new buildings of Parliament, it was not, you know, it was not a temple of modernism. It looked back to the Middle Ages. It looked back to the fact that Britain 
and Parliament, which was which was founded in the middle of the of the 1200s, the Parliament represented England as an organic society. It was not the French Revolution. Britain was not the French Revolution that overthrew the monarchy. Britain was a society which combined the monarchy and parliament. And therefore, what in fact, you know, this represented was the, that the Britain was rooted in the past. It was not just the Industrial Revolu Revolution. It was something that was much deeper. And here's an example of a sideboard that Pugin designed for the House of Lords. Both Pugin and Barry never lived to see it completed. They both died. It was the uh, Houses of Parliament were actually um, completed in 1870. So last, what I want to do is look at something that connects this to Pugin, and that is the idea of culture and society and the critique of civilization or liberal capitalist society that the pre-Raphaelites are really part of. And that involves looking at one of the works in the exhibit, which I have misspelled. And I was supposed to do that last night and, and change, but then I forgot. And that is Fort Maddox Brown's work, which is really one of the great works of the exhibition, one of the great pre-Raphaelite exhibits. In work, we see, as Fort Maddox Brown tells us, the ennoblement of labor, the figure in the middle, the muscular worker, they're doing sewer repairs and construction in Hampstead in North London, which is now a growing neighborhood of the metropolis of London. Here's actually what it looks like today. Um, oops. And, you know, Ford Maddox Ford tells us that this is a painting that represents all of society, but the working class is at the middle. In the back, we see marginal, but important, a bourgeois couple. On the side, we see three women. In the back, an evangelist who's trying to get working class people not to drink. You can see it's not working because the working class guy on the right is happily drinking his beer. The woman in the center represents kind of a bourgeois attractive woman that might even be Ford Maddox Brown's wife. The woman in the front is a working class girl with bare feet who is selling flowers, which kind of suggests this panorama of class society that he in fact is trying to represent. And so it seems important that, you know, if you think about this painting and it's a nobleman of labor and the working class, which is a new class of people, a people that for the first time in human history have nothing to sell but their labor power. Even medieval peasants had some kind of attachment to their land, but the proletariat or the working class just sells their labor. And in, you could say what might be a very, very, very brief uh, history of the, um, of the working class movement. We have, uh, I'm gonna give you uh, three images which describe in very, very, very brief form what the working class movement is about. So the first slide is of the Luddites. The word Luddite, which is still a word current in the English language, is now synonymous with being a technophobe, right? You know, I have colleagues that resisted email until like, you know, 10 years ago, because they were so horrified by the fact that, you know, they couldn't use pen and paper or a typewriter, or whatever it was. But that's what we associate with, you know, with, you know, with Luddus and people that are still using flip phones, for instance, would be, you know, an example that comes to mind. Um, and, but that's actually unfair to the Luddites who were handloom weavers that saw their world collapse with the mechanization of labor. And if they wanted jobs, they had to work at a fraction of the price in conditions that were no longer fulfilling to them. 
and no longer prestigious, but were in effect, you know, they became, as Dickens says in Hard Time, the hands. That's all they are, the hands. And so the Luddites smashed the machines, not because they were technophobes, because the machines represented the new capitalist relations that were their oppression. But this form of opposition to bourgeois capitalism is, you know, it's more like sporadic terrorism, right? It's not organized, it's local, you know, it's done in the cover of night, there's no ideology behind it. That comes a little later, the Luddites being maybe around 1813, 1814. This is 1819. This is an image by George Cruikshank of the famous massacre called Peterloo, which is 1819. And Peterloo, which is a, you know, a coalescence of the fact that it, the, the massacre took it place at St. Peter's Field in uh, near Manchester. And the Duke of Wellington, who defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, was the prime minister who called in the army. You put those together and you get Peterloo. And that's the way that it's, it's come down in uh, historical memory. And it represented a rally that was about not just smashing machines, but the beginning of demanding the right to vote, which in the context of 1819 was unthinkable for working class people. It was virtually unthinkable for middle class people. Middle class people in Britain don't really get the right to vote until 1832. The working class more or less in 1867 and most men in 1884. The third stage is Chartism. And this is the original charter, which it, it gets its name from in 1838. And Chartism is the first national working class movement anywhere because the English industrial class, working class is the first uh, working class that exists because of the industrial revolution. And the charter demanded male suffrage, universal male suffrage. There's huge struggles in the Chartist movement about women also achieving the vote, but it was more or less decided that that was such a pipe dream. And of course, there's also sexual antagonism that went on that it should be men first. And therefore the charter demanded the rights of men, all men to vote. It also demanded payment for members of parliament. So working class people could actually serve in parliament since they didn't have the income to do that. And the secret ballot, which at that time voting was an open, was open and public. A lot of voting took place because of bribery. People bought votes, you know, without any compulsion whatsoever. And if you're gonna buy a vote, you better see that the person exercised it in the right way. And therefore the secret ballot was also part of the charter. And here's an image of chartism, a cartoon that shows the charter as a scroll, maybe even a biblical scroll being rammed, literally rammed through parliament. In the context of the 1830s and the 1840s, it had little success of, you know, taking place. It was very difficult for working class people who were divided in all kinds of ways, including divisions between English and Irish workers to actually achieve anything, you know, being unified. And the way that the labor movement actually would progress in the second half of the 19th century was through trade unions. And then secondly, through the, through the creation of the Labor Party, which still exists today in 1906. So I think that this is one part 
of the Ford Maddox Brown painting to understand the context of the working class movement and the importance of the working class that, uh, that at least some of the pre-Raphaelites were interested in. And we go back to the painting because the other part of the painting that I wanna call your attention to is the two figures on the right. The, fur, the, the, the taller figure who's on the left, the bearded figure is Thomas Carlyle, who is one of the most important thinkers of the 19th century. I'm gonna to get to him actually second. And the figure on the right is F.D. Morris, who's one of the founders of Christian socialism. You know, most Americans don't think of Christian and socialism being in the same sentence, but the Christian socialists believed that in fact, capitalism was a perversion of Christianity, that the first Christians lived as a community and that, and that we were all actually together and should collectively own the means of production. And the Christian socialists played huge roles in creating educational institutions for working class people. And Morris in 1858 founded the first working class men's college. And working class education is a very important tradition in Britain. In the 20th century, it actually reaches university levels. So that at Oxford, there is Ruskin College, which became the kind of breeding ground for the, for the trade lab, labor movement, giving you know, university degrees and kind of creating an intellectual class for the labor movement. But the second figure that I want to talk about is Thomas Carlyle, who really is one of those, I think, increasingly lost figures in some ways, in you know, some ways, for, you know, I, completely understandable, but also in understanding the world of the 19th century, we have to restore him to the world that he actually existed in. Part of the reason that Carlyle is, um, has fallen into, um, I would say, a declining reputation is, you know, for good reason. One is his obsession with a kind of hero saving society from the exploitation that Marx also understood became by the end of his life kind of looking ahead to fascism. And secondly, there's, without a doubt, he was an out and out racist and really believed that blacks were inferior. Both these reasons in the, in the context of the 20th and 21st century are understandable. But in the 19th century, it's really hard to um, exaggerate Carlisle's influence. This is his house, which is in Chelsea in Southwest London, which is absolutely worth seeing. It's, a, it's you know, partly survived because of Carlisle and because people who admired Carlisle saved the buildings, but it's a, one of the very, very few great expressions of 18th century English architecture that exists in residential neighborhoods. And here I am contemplating Carlisle's house and, you know, perhaps dreaming of the day that I returned to London. I want to say two things about Carlisle before I finish with William Morris. And that is why Carlisle is important is because what Carlisle said was that the civilization that was being in existence was not just mechanical, but the people themselves were becoming machines. I sort of think of baseball. If you, if you look at the way the baseball players are now analyzed in a maze of statistics, they are in fact machinery. In fact, sports announcers refer to them as pieces of the team. And Carlisle says that not the external and physical alone is now managed by machinery, but the internal and spiritual also. The same habit regulates not our modes of action alone, but our modes of thought and feeling. Men are grown mechanical in head and in heart, as well as in hand. They have lost faith in the individual endeavor 
and a natural force of any kind and natural here being kind of counterposed to mechanical, which is artificial, not the internal perfection, but for external combinations and arrangements for institutions, constitutions, but for mechanism of one sort or other to the hope and struggle. The whole effort attachment opinions turn on, on mechanism and are of a mechanical character. And this really speaks to the kind of the spiritual quest of what's gonna become the pre raphaelites Also Char uh, Carlisle on Chartism, which is interesting because he understood the working class and why they aspired to end their exploitation, but he saw it not the way Marx would as the fact that there should be community ownership, but he saw it as the derogation of duty of the aristocracy that should lead. And therefore he envisioned a class of people that would be visionaries. It's an elite conception. He says, the living essence of Chartism has not been put down. Chartism means the bitter discontent grown fierce and mad. The wrong condition therefore, or the wrong disposition of the working class of England. He understands it, but he deplores it. It is a new name for a thing which has had many names and which will yet have many. The matter of Chartism is weighted, deep rooted, far extending, did not begin yesterday, will by no means end this day or tomorrow. It's a disease in society and it can only be redeemed by a new aristocracy. Hence, you can see that the criticisms of Marx and the criticisms of Carlyle, Marx quotes Carlyle in the Communist Manifesto all over the place, but Carlyle represents the Gothic, the nostalgic, where Marx is looking forward to a different kind of world. And this is where I end with William Morris, who also is a principal figure in the exhibit. Morris comes out of the tradition of the Gothic revival. Morris comes out of the tradition of Carlyle and then John Ruskin, who is sort of a bridge between Carlyle and the pre-Raphaelites. Morris is an extraordinary figure in the late 19th century. Morris was an artist, an architect. He designed furniture, he designed wallpaper. He translated Icelandic sagas. He wrote utopias about the future. He organized the Socialist League, which was a working class party and went up and down as an activist to create a working class party. There's just no exaggerating the, the towering presence of Morris in intellectual, in intellectual life. And uh, here's a picture of Morris. I wanna show three images that I think, you know, talk about something of Morris's extraordinary um, life and productivity, the link between the pre-Raphaelites and the arts and crafts movement. The arts and crafts movement extending really all over Europe and the United States and, and beyond. This is the Red House, which is in Bexley Heath in Kent. This was um, designed with everything that was local. It was handcrafted because Morris hated the ugliness of the Industrial Revolution. He hated the mechanized labor. He hated the fact that these that these great skills were being lost and were disappearing. The furnishings look back to the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. The second is in the exhibit. I, I photographed this myself, which is a, a textile from 1888. The paradox of Morris is that he's a socialist who created a lucrative company Morris and Company that existed until the 1930s, which might speak to the kind of contradictions of being a revolutionary and capitalist society. But this absolutely beautiful textile, all based on skilled labor, 
is really, you know, it really tells the industrial revolution of mechanized labor, you know, and, you know, and textiles being its absolute centrality. There is another reality. There's another alternative. There's an alternative set of values that's represented here. And I end up with a dining room. I actually tried to really think of a great ending for this, but really, you know, I'm not really sure if there's a, if there's a great ending, but I actually love this dining room, which is the Victoria and Albert Museum. Morris designed this in the 1860s. It's been, since I've gone to the V&A, which is really my favorite museum in London, it's been a restaurant, a coffee shop, nothing. But I really like to think of this as being a dining area in which I can contemplate Morris's genius and the contradictions of being both opposed to industrial capitalism and all it stood for, and also being immersed in it. Thank you very much. Professor Dworkin, thank you so much. <laughs> that, was, that was tremendous. Um, we do have some time for some questions, and I would um, uh, invite everybody to use the Q&A feature to, uh, to submit any questions that you might have. And in fact, we have a question coming in from somebody with a curious last name. We've got Dennis Dworkin asking, what do you see as the meaning of the size slash weight of the British and the background um, and the background man in the Chartist slides. I'm uh, which which uh, which slide are we talking yeah. about? Um, submit the Chartist slides. I've stopped your sharing, so you'll have to okay to do that uh, to go back and, and check on that. Uh, the next question is asking if it's possible to tour the Red House. I, I believe that it is. It is. Uh, the, the with red, COVID I, times, who knows if that's possible. I have never been to the Red House, but the Red House, the red house is now uh, part of the National Trust. The National Trust is one of the extraordinary uh, British um, institutions that is a kind of private-public uh, partnership. And yes, you can tour the, to, uh, tour the Red House. It's not as easy to get to if you're, if you're not going by car, but you can de definitely tour it. I'm um, trying to look at the charter slides. Oh, the man in the back. Um, really interesting. An ambiguous figure. Um, and I guess the question is specifically about the size and weight of the British and in comparison and in, in that, that man in the background? Um, I think it's kind of a parody on, I would think it's a parody on leadership as opposed to the actual workers who are doing it. That would be my guess. And so the, you know, so the, uh, you know, the very prominent stomach is a, is a sign of affluence and also he's doing nothing. Whereas, you know, the, the downtrodden are actually doing the work. That would be my guess that it's actually a kind of social criticism. So Kathleen asks, uh, well, she starts off by saying wonderful lecture, so grateful. Uh, she's wondering about the connection between the ideas of the working class, uh, that the working class only had the capacity to sell their labor, uh, the very skilled craftspeople, uh, craftsmanship of the workers prior to the industrial revolution, the workers and the pre-Raphaelites. Did they identify themselves as craftsmen working class, middle class, wealthy with responsibility, or were they identifying themselves as something else? And perhaps you can speak a little bit to their point of view. I know that you're not you know, quite a art historian, but what were they trying to represent um, when tackling ideas of workers' issues or decrying the changes in the ways that the, uh, well, the ways of the world at this time? If I, if I understand the question is, you know, what were the, what were the, Hopefully, if I understand it, is what is how did the working class imagine itself in the 18th century? Yeah. I think that there is a, you know, it's very easy to romanticize the working class 
as if it was exploited in the 19th century, but everything was great in the 18th century. That's obviously not true, but particularly among weavers in which weaving families for generations, you know, evolved these skills. And sometimes these skills were not, you know, there was elaborate rites in which these skills were handed down and not shared. There was a lot of prestige, especially in weaving, much less so in spinning. Um, that I think is absolutely central. And then other than Morris, um, who had you know, a ton, ton of influence, did the pre-Raphaelites in your opinion, um, Bob is asking, have genuine influence or were they merely a, um, a symptom of the nostalgia that was sweeping, uh, that, was, that was confluent uh, with, with the progress at this time? Well, I think an art historian could probably answer this better, but I think that the, I think that, I think that the nostalgia that is represented in the pre-Raphaelites actually hits a nerve, and particularly in English society, that I think that people consume this. That I think that there's a lot of contradictory feelings about about modern modernization in 19th century Britain. And that nostalgic as nostalgia, as I said, is a is a central component of modernization. So I think that that the the pre-Raphaelites really do capture something. And I mean, this is a you know this kind of nostalgia is much much broader than just the visual arts. It also exists in literature, particularly say in in Gothic novels. And I would I would add to that just based on the the talk that we had from Dr. Tim Berenger a couple of weeks ago that, you know, we can look at the the influence and the continuance of the pre-Raphaelite aesthetic in straight through into modern era. Um, and you can even look at 60s and 70s rock posters and find imagery and styles that are that are present. So I think they definitely, their influence uh, affected aesthetic culture moving forward um, uh, beyond any influence they may have had on the sort of overall mindset of the working class and the topics that were covered today. Um, there's a couple of really quick questions I'm going to get out of the way, which uh, somebody's asking um, if there's anywhere to be able to access this talk again. And yes, we are recording it, and we hope to have it posted to our YouTube page and on our event uh, website uh, within a week or so. Uh, in addition to the Ford Maddox Brown painting that was referenced, um, the William Morris tapestry that Professor Dworkin shared is also in view at the museum. Those are the two works that are featured in the in the Victorian Radicals uh, exhibition. One question that came in from Trudy, uh, Professor Dworkin, is around this idea if there's these ideals that uh, could have been you know, rooted in nostalgia that women were supposed to be mothers and homemakers. Um, how did they end up being the main, be, becoming the hands um, and, and working their way into factories? Well, I mean, I guess the short answer to that is that Mechanized labor, which was a process of de-skilling, made uh, female and child labor much more, uh, you know, much more appealing. And also, it was a way of undercutting male labor. So, for the working class, women did enter the workforce in ways that they hadn't before, which caused a lot of consternation among, especially evangelical Christians, but. For middle-class women, it very often meant the reverse. It meant a kind of a disappearance from public life where in the 18th century, they might be very, very much involved in say shopkeeping and live above a shop. For women uh, who are middle-class, it very much involved a separation between public and private life, which historians refer to as separate spheres. Um, thank you. I, so I think we've got time for one more question. This is a really great question that came in uh, from Mary. Um, and she first off says, uh, thank you for your presentation. She was wondering that as you discuss the link between industrialism, romanticism and the artwork of the pre-Raphaelites, um, she got her thinking, at, and she knows that you're not an art historian, but how might you expect or how might we expect Art in our current era to transform as technology advances. You could say that we're in a techn technological revolution in this moment. 
and she says that again she recognizes you're not an art historian but do you have any guesses on how design or aesthetic component uh components that might stay and or change as we move forward based on what you know about this period I don't know. that's a great <laughs> question and uh you know i think it deserves at least a couple of glasses of wine but yes. uh, i think the one of the things that's really different in the in the 21st century is just the proliferation of media that exists that you know begins with photography and uh, also societies that are just much more fragmented so it's just much more complex what the relationship between art and society means in societies that which are just more fragmented and which have so many communities. Whereas I think in the 19th century, it's, you know, it's much easier to talk about, you know, a society being very, very much, you know, connected to its art. But as I said, that's at least a two glass, two glasses of wine. Yeah, that, that could be its whole, its own public program. And I think that one of the things that we could we could say about that or that we can definitely see is that the technological revolution or changes that we're seeing at this time are changing how we, you know, to your point, digest art, have access to art. And you see things emerging like non-fungible tokens or NFTs, which uh, is, a, is a blockchain technology that's emerging within the art world right now. And so the way that the way that art's exchanged, viewed and accessed is, is changing um, daily. So uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you very much, uh, Professor okay. Dworkin, for spending the evening with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, thank you. for coming. I really appreciate it. Although I've, and, I uh, prefer to see you in, okay. in person. Well, I hope that we, we have you uh, into the museum at some point in the near future. Uh, as a reminder, the Victorian Radicals, the Pre-Raphaelites um, exhibition is currently on view. The museum is open and um, we invite you to come down and, and see the exhibition. Uh, again, I'd like to thank all of the exhibition sponsors for their generous support and, and allowing us to bring this exhibition to Northern Nevada and share it with these audiences. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Uh, this okay. program was recorded and we will try to get it up online as quick as possible for you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.